do a podcast? I am. The question is, are you? I think so. Finally. Uh, even though my computer decided to freeze up as I tried to go live. I was going to say, could you tell what happened? Or I have no idea what happened. I think I was trying to get it to do too much at once. Hello and welcome to Learning the Law, a podcast about all things legal with a focus on current events where we try to teach you things in an hour. My name is Ashley, a.k.a. Phoenix Nymphy, and my co-host, who is the man of the hour, my husband, Ron, even though today is International Women's Day, so it's my hour to shine. This podcast is purely educational and should not be taken as legal advice. This podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship. This podcast is based on our interpretation of relevant law and any opinions expressed are the opinions of the individuals expressing them and do not reflect the opinions of any firm, company, or other individuals. Ron is a licensed practicing attorney in the state of California. Yes, I am. And I have been since 1999. And I just want you to know, honey, that you shine every hour. Ah, uh, you're so sweet. Shut up. We are now officially on Patreon. Please consider supporting the podcast through there. You can find it on patreon.com slash learning the law. And if you would like to sponsor the podcast, we are looking for sponsors. Please email us at twolazydogsmedia at gmail.com. We want to grow this and do more and educate because we really enjoy this. And as always, for more content, content from us, please check out my TikTok at Phoenix Nymphy. You can get more. And um, yeah, so I we t- so last week I took the week off except for the podcast. So we did the actual podcast. Um, and what did we talk about again? Oh, yeah, the Texas trans law or Texas. Well, it's not a law, but the opinion. Uh, yeah. Um, They're very, trying to implement it like it is a law. They are trying not. to implement it like it's a law. It's not a law. Um, and the safety of trans uh, kids and families is uh, very dire right now. But we, the last couple of podcasts that we've done have been very serious. So today, because today is International Women's Day, uh, and we are in the month of women's history, we are celebrating women today, or this whole month, today, I decided... Which we did this last year, and uh, so we're doing again this year, and we've got even more ladies to chat about this year. Um, so we're going to just kind of relax and chill and talk about some badass ladies through history. I'm excited because um, I was looking up uh, women in history, like lawyers and judges specifically. And I found all kinds of stuff from uh, other countries as well as from the U.S. So I'm really excited to talk about other countries who have um, history, like, you know, other countries who have history of these badass ladies. So we're going to highlight. So a lot of this, um, what I've obviously the notes will be up on the, the website tomorrow. Uh, this is from uh, women. This is from Law Librarians of Congress. Yeah, the Library of Congress. So, um, and this article, this blog article thing was written in 2015 uh, by Kelly Buchanan. And uh, she just has a couple of blurbs on women throughout uh, history in various countries. And she starts off with Argentina. So she goes by alphabetical order. Um, So Maria Angelica Barredas was the first woman admitted to practice law in Argentina in 1910. Margarita Argas was the first woman to be appointed judge of the Supreme Court in Argentina in 1970 during the military government. And before current, ours, huh? That was before our first uh, female, yeah, Supreme Court justice, yeah. Which is yeah. Currently, Elena uh, Hayton de Nolasco is the only woman member of the seven-member Supreme Court. 
uh, after the death in 2014 of Carmen Argibe, uh, who is the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court under a democratic government. Nice. Way to go, Argentina. Um, the In Brazil, the first woman to graduate from law school was uh, uh, Mirthes Gomes de Campos, who finished law school in 1898. However, it was not until 1906 that she was admitted to the Institute of Brazilian Lawyers, um, which is their bar association, which is pretty wild. The first woman to ever become judge in 1954 was Teresa Grisalia Tang. Um, she took the exam in 1954 and passed and became substitute judge of the 12th Circuit of uh, the state of Santa Catarina. Wow, that's that's before we ever got our first. Like, that's crazy. That's so cool. It's uh, yeah. In Brazil, trial judges need to take an exam. Yeah. Unlike here. I kind of like that, though. Yeah, I'd take that exam. <laughs> Since, you know, I'm not that well connected to get appointed judge. Yeah. Ah, so in China, um, the legal profession was not formally established until 1979 to 1980. Uh, but women have never been excluded from the law schools or legal practice or judgeships throughout the history of uh, People's Republic of China. Um, According to this article, they have women law graduates and lawyers even prior to the founding of the PRC in 1949. Uh, the first minister of justice was Miss Liang Shi, and uh, gra who graduated from law school and started practicing in the 20s and 30s before she was appointed as minister in 49. So that's actually kind of progressive of China. <laughs> well, you know. Can't, I can't say too much. They're supposed to be, they are supposed to be quote unquote communist. Although, you know, my feeling there's never truly been a communist government. Um, it's that's more of an ideal, but uh, yeah, if, if, the, if everyone is supposed to be uh equal in a communist government, then they need to have women justices. Um, currently, there are three, three out of the 16 court leaders are women uh, in the current Supreme People's Court in China. Um, so Egypt is the, I really like this article. So I'm going to like go through each country that they highlighted because I just find, I just found this very, very, very cool. Um, the first woman lawyer in Egypt was now I'm going to I'm going to butcher all of these names and I apologize because I didn't listen to them first. I should have, but there's a lot of names to have listened to. Um, Naima Elias Al Ayubi, who graduated with a law degree from Cairo in 33 and in 2003, Tahani Al uh, Gebali became the first woman to hold a judicial position. Wow, that took a long time. That took a long time. It did. Um, she held that position until 2012, and she remained the only female judge in Egypt until 2007, when the Supreme Judicial Council selected 31 women to serve as judges in the country. Holy crap! So they're like, you know what? We're behind. We're going to catch up. We're going to try to catch up. <laughs> Uh, there needs to be more, obviously, but that's a, you know, it's a start. Um, so in France, the, it appears, which, so it says it appears the first woman to graduate from French university with a law degree was actually from Romania. So, um, the reason, I guess it appears they, I guess when they use that language, they're not 100% positive on the accuracy of that, correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. 
these records go back over a hundred years. So. Right, right. So, um, so she was of Romanian descent. Sa- Sarmisa Bilsesco, um, who first registered in 1884, and she obtained her li- license in 1887 and a doctorate in 1890. Holy crap! That's so baller. <laughs> That's like just hearing women before the 1900s do anything beyond going to college, like getting a doctorate in any country to me is just really, really freaking cool. Um, She then returned to Romania where she was admitted to the bar, thus becoming Europe's first woman attorney. Holy cow. Uh, the first women to be admitted in the bar in France were Olga Petit and Jean uh, Jean Chauvin, 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 uh, yep. or Chauvin, who were respectively sworn in in December sixth and nineteenth, nineteen hundred. Uh, and it wouldn't be until forty six that women would become judges in France. Um, however, the portion, the proportion of ju- women judge women among French judges has risen very quickly over recent years and women represent 57% of the French judiciary and recent graduating classes from the Ecole Nationale de la Magistrature uh, have been composed of up to 80% women, which is the National Judges School. Yep. That's crazy cool. Holy crap. All right, so France is clearly leading us when it comes to women in the legal field, like as far as this in the upper echelon. Like France is clearly winning out as far as women judges right now. <laughs> right now, yeah. <laughs> um, Germany, uh, women were admitted to universities in Germany depending on the state. Uh, So between 1900 and 1909, uh, and then in 1913, among 9,003 law students in the German Empire, there were 51 women. That was it. Uh, Until the passage of the law on the admission of women to the offices and professions of justice on July 11th, 1922, women graduates were not permitted to take the state exam uh, for the practice of law in Germany. So until they passed that law, they weren't even allowed to practice, even though they could go to school, which is weird. Uh, Germany's first woman judge was Maria Hagemeyer. Hagem- 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 I think that's right. Hagemeyer. Uh, who became the judge, uh, who became judge in 1927. And then in 33, in 1933, all female judges were dismissed. By the Nazi regime. Um, Erna Scheffler was the first woman to be appointed as a justice of the federal constitutional court in 1951. So I guess that was post Nazi regime. That is our first woman to come back and be a judge. Yeah. Um, and then Juta Limbach was its first female president in 1994. And there are currently five women among the 16 justices of their Supreme Court. Uh, That's actually quite sad that um, that's quite sad that it's that right there makes it. So I have a thought on that. And my thought is when you have a regime like the Nazi regime and you end up going backwards. You you end up going back backwards and you kind of have to start from ground zero again to come forward. And that's sad. Like, I mean, look at France and then look at like, we read about France. Who's like, yeah, we need to fix this and bring more people in. And then you have Germany. Who's like, Eh, okay, we'll start letting women again, but we're not going to try to like catch up. You know what I mean? Like that's just really and America does it. America does that too. Like absolutely. Well, well if you look at Germany, they at least have had a female leader of the Supreme Court. We never have. 
This is true. This is very true. Um, but uh, it's just I don't I don't know. It's just like you you make progress. It's like two steps forward, one step back. Because you have people who are just so you have Nazis, literally Nazis, white supremacists. Like, what is it about white people who keep holding progress from moving forward? Uh, they're scared to lose power. Who cares? Well, they're the ones in power. And if they're scared to lose power, they're not going to give it up too easily. I mean, I guess maybe because I'm a white person who's never had any kind of power in my life. I don't get it. Um, but like, I, I don't know. I just see so many people who are just so. Um, just badass, you know, and just should be like, for example, Stacey Abrams, who uh, just put in her bit. She just officially made it. She made it official for her run for uh, governor again. Uh, in Georgia, which I hope she wins. Um, where I'm a Stacey Abram stan over here. I stand Stacey Abrams. She's amazing. Uh, she's done so much work for Georgia, which is my home state. Um, but yeah, just anyway, we'll get back on track. I mean, I'm essentially reading this thing, so I'll try and... I won't read it all, but there's a lot of really cool people here. Um, we've got Germany, we've got Greece, we've got Indonesia, Israel, um, Japan. Uh, in 1929, the Meiji University became the first school to make it possible for female students to actually study law. And then in, for in 1940, the first three women were admitted to the bar following a 1936 revision of the relevant law, Masako Nakata, who later became the director of the Japan Federal Federation of Bar Associations. Um, and then Yoshiko Sanfuchi became the first female judge in 1949, um, which is just really cool. And then Ai Kume, who was one of the founding members and the first chairperson of the Japan Women's Bar Association. Established in 1950 and later a delegate to the United Nations. Currently, three of the 15 members of the Supreme Court of Japan are women. Uh, which is not surprising because, like, I mean, the Asian countries are still very slow on women. Like, women in business is still, it's hard. Like, it's still very, very it's very misogynistic for women in a lot of Asian countries. Very, I mean, same here, but um, it's it's a different type of misogyny, if that makes sense. Or do, is it? I don't know. I mean, like, are there different types of misogyny or is there just misogyny? Uh, Yeah, I guess it just. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I don't like and. I don't want it to sound like I'm stereotyping, but it is no. I mean, one of the most famous characters out of Japan doesn't have a mouth for a reason. Um, Hello Kitty. Like, she doesn't have a mouth for a reason. Like, you know why she doesn't have a mouth, right? Because women are supposed to be silent. No, I didn't realize Hello Kitty didn't have a mouth since I've never seen it. You've seen Hello Kitty, babe. I promise Not you. Not the actual episodes. No, no, no. I'm talking I mean, about like all the Hello Kitty merchandise. Like she, ne she doesn't have a mouth. Yeah, I've seen that. I just never paid attention to it. I didn't to be honest. realize that until someone pointed it out. And they pointed it out a long time ago. And I was like, that makes sense, though. Um, so, I mean, that's actually really progressive for Japan. Uh, but, of course, we want to see more. You know, we want to see half. Because half. You know, you have, you know, you, you want to see more. You want to see more because I was I was about to say a very transphobic comments and which uh, is half of the world are women. But that's not true because gender is fluid. What we want to see is more than men on these, you know, 
uh, on these courts because more than men live in this world, you know, non-binary, trans, um, gender fluid, all kinds. Um, so, oh, uh, in 1898, Mexico actually had a woman graduate. Her name was Mar Maria Asuncion Sandoval de Zarco. Woo! I know I butchered part of that middle name, but um, she graduated in 1898. Holy cow. That's wow. Yeah, but they, they didn't get their first judge until... 1974. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and currently there's only two women on their Supreme Court out of 10. So, and there is one vacancy according to uh, this. Well, this was in 2015. They've probably replaced it. Um, the cartels do like to shoot their judges. So, yikes. Yeah. Um, so Ethel Benjamin became New Zealand's first woman lawyer when she was admitted as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of New Zealand in May 1897. And she was awarded her Bachelor of Law degree in July of 1897. So um kind of want to live in New Zealand. <laughs> you just want to see all the Lord of the Ring sites. I mean, but New Zealand's kind of doing it right, you know? They're also yeah, a smaller I, country, so they're able to do it right. I'd love to at least visit there. Um, there is currently two women on their six-member Supreme Court bench in New Zealand as of 2015. Um, Nicaragua. Yep. Olga Nunez de Ceballos became the first uh, attorney in 1945 in Nicaragua um, before she became elected to the National Assembly in 1957. And the first female judge was Joaquina Vega. Um, and in 1948, and there are currently five justices on their 16 member Supreme Court. So that's kind of cool. That's a big Supreme Court. And why is it an even number, not an odd number? Well, you'd have to look and see if uh, it needs to be unanimous or mm -hmm. whether all the judges hear every case or if they split some up. Uh, so Pakistan, uh, which was which was uh, part of India. Uh, when did they split from India? In the 30s? No, I want to say was it, uh, it was after World War II. Was it later? Yeah, because I, I know the Gurkhas still um, were in the British Army during World War II. 1947. August 15th, 1947. Okay. Um, so their first... Just their first female justice or uh, judge, uh, Majida Rizvi, uh, Rizvi, was appointed in 1994 uh, of the High Court. Actually, that's pretty cool. Um, and then the first female judge to be appointed to their federal sh uh, Sharia uh, court. Yep. Uh, is Ash Ashraf Jehan? I believe that's their religious court. Okay, okay. And then there currently there are no women on their Supreme Court. Not surprised. Um to be honest, not surprised. I'm actually really surprised on Russia here being so early. <laughs> um not surprised either, it, honestly. Really? Ekaterina Fleisch Fleischitz, 1888 to 1968 was the first Russian female criminal defense lawyer. She graduated from Sorbonne University in 1907 and passed the exams of St. Petersburg University in 1909. And on uh, November 5th, she was allowed by the court to represent a client, but was later removed from the case by the Minister of Justice. 
1911, women were allowed to be admitted to Russian law schools. However, they could not practice law until 1917. Yep. And the, can, you, you know what happened in 1917? Uh, no. Wait. The, the Bolshevik Revolution. Okay. Ah. In the Russian, so is that when like Anastasia disappeared? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the last that, czar was killed. And, Gotcha. Yep. In the Russian Empire, women were not allowed to be judges. However, during the Soviet period, involvement of women in the judiciary became a political factor. Not surprising. Reportedly, in 1924, women made up 13.7% of judges in the country. And this figure increased to 18.8% in 1926. Later, judgeship was considered a female profession with women in different periods making up to 80% of the Soviet Russian judiciary. Today, yep. though, th three of the 19 members of the Constitutional Court are women. So yeah. they Russia's been up and down with their lady ladies of the law. Yeah, and currently, you know, since Putin's in charge of everything, there's only three. That's not surprising. Mm -mm. Um, so you have South Africa, Thailand, um, first law student in Thailand was, uh, Chunying Ram, I'm not, I can't, I'm, I'm going to do horrible, P-H-R-O-M-M-O-B-O-N, Ramabon, um, Bunny Prasap. B U N Y A P R A S O P uh, attended the first law school in Thailand in 1927 and became the first barrister, women barrister in 1930. And then the first judge was uh, uh, Shal Shalorjit Jitaruta, uh, was appointed in 1965. Um, and currently they have nine people on their Supreme Court. None of them are judges. That's in Thailand. And then you have the UK and then the United States, um, which I think I think you meant to say there's nine judges on the court. None of them are women. Yes. What did I say? You said there are nine women on the court and none of them are judges. <laughs> God. <laughs> I okay in my brain I said it the other way. Got I know. Uh, I love it when my uh brain go fast go goes. Is brain super fast go goes, right? What what is it that he called when your brain goes super fast and your mouth won't follow? Um anyway. So I highly recommend checking out this article. It's very cool. I did skip some of the countries cuz there's a lot in there. Um but definitely go check those out. Um, and that's the international ladies of law. So we'll bring it home to the U S and talk about the ladies in the U S. Um, would you like to talk about Margaret Brent? Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know about Margaret Brent. She was actually an attorney slash advocate during the colonial period. And she was the first uh, female to appear in front of the common court uh, judges defending and pursuing civil law. Cool. Yeah. And that was in the 1600s. 16, 1648. Yeah. Wow. Holy crap. That's kind yep. of wild because I mean, like you didn't have to go to law school back then to practice law. You just no. needed to know how to read, basically. <laughs> that already puts you in front of 95 percent of the people. <laughs> um, um, not only did she do that, the governor of Maryland, the Maryland colony back then appointed her the executrix of his estate when he died. Uh, the governor? 
Yeah. Oh, so she was the his executor of his will or whatever. Yes. Wow. That's cool. That's cool. Now, of course, she was, you know, from a noble family. They couldn't let any any commoners be be uh, attorneys. Yes, but if people don't use their privilege to help push progress, then they're not going to help the less fortunate. You know, that's yeah, kind of what you're supposed to do. She was one of thirteen kids. Holy crap! <laughs> um, Arabella Mansfield is officially the first woman. Uh, the first woman to be a lawyer in the United States. Um, and that was in 1869. She was admitted to the Iowa bar. Yeah. Um, um, a lot of her, her career was, she was an educator and an administrator in college. Um, and despite Iowa state restricting the bar to males, uh, she took it and earned high scores. And because of that, um, you know, they amended their license. They amended its licensing statute and became the first state to accept women and minorities into its bar. Yeah, she was self-taught as well. She didn't go to law school. Yes, um, she actually studied under her brother for two years. Yeah, you can't really do that too much anymore in the U.S. Uh, New York lets you do it, and California lets you do it. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, most states want you to go to an ABA school. The first female judge, uh, first judge justice of peace, uh, was... A lady named Esther Hobart Morris. And um, she, it was in Wyoming before it was even a state. It was still a territory. And she served a term of almost nine months. Uh, they appointed her. Um, they appointed her as justice too. Not like she ran, like she was appointed as justice. Which is... I think a really interesting when they appoint because a lot if you notice a lot of the ladies in in the other in um in the other countries were also appointed, which means somebody picked this woman out of this group of people, mostly men probably, and said, "I want her." Yeah. Also, remember Wyoming has always had uh, its women vote. Yes. Yes. That's also true. Women have always had the right to vote in Wyoming. Um, I'm just going to name a couple of names real quick. Genevieve R. Klein was the first judge um, on the customs courts, which is the first federal judge. Sandra Day O'Connor was the first woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, and then... Uh, politically, we've got a lot of ladies in political history that were not necessarily in law, but have done a lot of political stuff. I mean, um, obviously you have Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, and you know, all of the ladies of the, of the suffrage, you know, the suffrage movement. Um, one of the ones which I, uh, we talked about her last year. And I want to talk about her again. Um, is uh, Shirley? Let me find. Let me pull her up. She's more recent history, but Shirley Chisholm. Um, she became the first Black woman to serve in Congress, and she remained in the House of Representatives until 1989 or 82, and that was in 1968. And uh, the reason why I wanted to highlight her again is because Shirley Chisholm did a lot of work for um women black women um black people like she did a lot for women of color specifically 
And um, I just like to highlight her every year because she's just got, she just has like a really, really awesome, like her and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, like those are two ladies that I, I really look up to, uh, you know, notorious RBG. Yeah. Um, she worked very hard and she's very outspoken. And, uh, I mean, she dealt with death threats and stuff, especially as a black woman. I mean, she started, she started out working as a nursery school teacher and became the first female Congress, black Congresswoman. I know that's pretty awesome. Um, do you have any ladies that you would like to highlight? Well, uh, one of the ones I'd like to highlight is Victoria Woodhull. Oh, yeah. 1872. Doesn't have the right to vote. Publisher, stockbroker, uh, protege of Cornelius Vanderbilt. She runs for president. <laughs> Even though she doesn't have the right to vote yes. on what was on what was the Equal Rights Party ticket, which was a ticket that for the time would be considered a uh, radical left, but now would be a uh, moderate, maybe slightly to the left, and um, a number of women ran on the Equal Rights Party in ensuing elections until it uh, it just kind of fizzled. She ended up getting votes, which was oh, yeah. what was really did. cool about it. Like she ended up getting like 40 something votes. Which is huge for back then because I mean it wasn't women voting, it was men. Uh let's see, does it tell me here? Oh, yeah, she ran against Ulysses Grant. It doesn't tell me here how many votes she got. But I read it somewhere. I forget where I read it, but it was like 40-something votes, I think, that she got. Because I know the, the lady from New York, uh, Stanton, mm -hmm. uh, when she ran for a house, she got 21 or 24 votes of the 12,000. Maybe that's who I was thinking of was Stanton. And it, okay. And I flipped the numbers. Okay. That might be who I was thinking of. Another one that's actually kind of interesting is um, Abigail Adams, wife to President John Adams. Um, she opposed slavery. She pushed for women's rights and education. Um, and she has, you know, famous line of, remember the ladies was followed by urging her husband not to put such put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands remember remember all men would be tyrants if they could while her husband traveled on revolutionary and political duties she took over and managed the family farm and business affairs she was also mother to another president john quincy adams yep so and she was very vocal about her, her opposition to slavery um, uh, in 1869, Julia Addington became the first woman elected to a public office in Iowa, uh, which could possibly most likely makes her the first woman ever elected to any office in the U.S., Wow. Yeah. Because it wasn't until um, 1923 you had the first Latina and first woman of color to hold a statewide elective office. And that was uh, Soledad Chacon. Yes. Yeah. Uh, New Mexico, Secretary of State. Interesting. And then uh, 1924, you had the first 
Native American woman in a state legislature in Michigan. Yeah, that uh, Cora Bell Reynolds Anderson. Yeah. She was from La Pointe Band of the Chippewa tribe, also known as Ojibwe. Oh. The first openly gay person elected to a U.S. Uh, as a U.S. senator was a woman from Wisconsin. Did you know that? I did not know that. Tammy Baldwin. That was more recent, wasn't it? Um, she served in the House from 1990, 1999 to 2013. Um, she advocated for health care reform, sponsored action related to women's rights. Such, such as National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program Reauthorization Act of 2007. Um, and she serves on several subcommittees for the Senate Committee on a, a, Appropriations, a proportions is what I was trying to read. Appropriations, including for the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. She is still active and she was the first woman openly gay person ever voted. Um, here's one that I would really like to highlight as well. Mary McLeod Bethune. Eight, from eight, she, was, uh, elect, she was the director of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration from 1936 to 19, 1944. Uh, she also advised Franklin President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on minority affairs and interracial relations, advocating for blacks to be served by New Deal policies and was the head of FDR's black cabinet, an unofficial but important role. The Women's Army Corps was integrated because of her work as a member of the advisory board and the daughter of former slaves, Bethune saw education was key to racial equality and started a school in Daytona Beach, Florida, which later became one of the few colleges of its time open to black students. Bethune founded the National Council of Negro Women in 1935 and served as vice president of the NAACP from 1940 until her death in 1955. Heck yeah, Mary McLeod Bethune. She is a badass. Um, 1984, uh, Geraldine Ferraro. Yes. First woman to ever run on a major party's national ticket when yep. she was, uh, selected as vice president. Unfortunately, it was by Walter Mondale who <laughs> lost in a landslide. Um, she would have been a better candidate than he. He was not a very, and even though I was only six, 16, 17 at the time, he, he was boring. <laughs> boring, uh, slow speaker, not, yeah, they could have gotten somebody better. Like Geraldine Ferrara. <laughs> So the first woman of color elected to the U.S. Senate representing Illinois from 1993 to 1999 was Carol Mosley Braun. It wasn't until 93 that we got our first black female senator. That. Doesn't surprise me either. No. Um, in 93, though, she convinced the Judiciary Committee not to renew a design patent for the United Daughters of the Confederacy as it included the Confederate flag. Yeah. <laughs> I find that funny. Uh, also in 93, you had Janet Reno. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. First uh, um, female attorney general of the U.S. Um, 
So the first official woman or the first Asian American woman to serve in a presidential cabinet. I don't like to mention her because she's married to Mitch McConnell, but she is the first Asian American woman to serve in a presidential cabinet, which is Elaine Chow. But she is extremely uh, corrupt. So, um, along I'm not with gonna, Mitch, yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time on her. But she is the first Asian American lady to serve in a cabinet. It was George Bush's cabinet. She was appointed Secretary of Labor. Um, then you got Madeleine Albright, first woman who is uh, Secretary of State. Yep. I mean, you got to mention the first woman to ever run, uh, the first woman nominated by a major party for president, which is, as we know, Hillary Clinton. Um, <sighs> it was an unsuccessful bid, and then we got four years of Cheeto poop. Um, <laughs> I know. I the unfortunate thing about that nickname is I like Cheetos. <laughs> um, there's so many, there's so many cool ladies. Um, and then, of course, you know, let's let's chat about RBG, the notorious RBG. She was nominated to the Supreme Court by Clinton in 93. Uh, from a, a previous position as a U.S. Uh, appeals district of Columbia circuit judge. Um, the Brooklyn opera buff boasts many first. Yes. First woman to serve on two major law reviews, Harvard Law Review and Columbia Law Review. First tenured female Columbia Law School professor and co-author of the first case book on sex discrimination. She's known for her opinions on, you know, gender equality and notably the landmark United States versus Virginia, which allowed women to attend Virginia Military Institute. Um, may she rest in peace. Yeah, she was pretty awesome. <clears throat> um, another Supreme Court justice, Sonia Sotomayor. Mm -hmm. uh, well, she was a third female member, but she is the first Hispanic. Oh yes, member of the court. Um, Fanny Lou Hammer fought for civil rights as a leader of the movement and member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And also co-founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964. She got involved with efforts to register black voters in the South in 1962. And during her time with the SNCC, took part in peaceful demonstrations that left her exposed to beatings and violence. As the vice chair of Mississippi Freedom Democrat of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Hammer opposed her state's all-white delegation at the Democratic Convention in 64, where her alternate her alternative party captured the national spotlight for the civil rights movement. Hammer unsuccessfully ran for Congress in 64, but took part in forming the National Women's Political Caucus in 1971. Fannie Lou Hammer. Hmm. And we're going through all the uh, political women first. You got to put Kamala Harris in there. Yes. Very first female vice president. That is the highest ranking uh, position any woman has ever held in this country. And she is of um, African American, she is of African American descent and uh, I believe Asian descent. Um, um yeah, it, India is considered part of Asia. Yes. Oh, it's okay. I wasn't, I thought it was Indian, but I couldn't quite remember if it was. Yeah. So, um, uh, Patricia Roberts Harris was named Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in 77. She became the first black woman to hold a cabinet position. 
Uh, at Senate hearings for her appointment, senators question how someone of her elevated position could understand the needs of the people the Department of Housing and Urban Development focused on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? She literally. L oh, OK, so her comment was, Senator, I am one of them. You do not understand who I am. I am a black woman, the daughter of a dining car worker. I'm a black woman who even eight years ago could not buy a house in parts of the District of Columbia. I didn't start out as a member of a prestigious law firm, but as a woman who needed a scholarship to go to school. If you think I have forgotten that, you are wrong. She later served as Secretary of Health and Education and Welfare from 1979 to 1981. Heck yes. Yes, ma'am. Patricia Roberts Harris. Um, that's, you know, that's the same thing of like talking about, um, uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson, the, the crap that like, why do we need to know her LSAT scores? You've, you didn't ask that for Amy Coney Barrett or whatever the, f her name is or, or anyone else. Like you didn't, why, why do you need her? Why, why do you need her LSATs? Why does that even matter? She passed the bar at Harvard. She clearly is smarter than you, Tucker Carlson. Clearly. Also, can we spend the rest of the night maybe talking about Katanji Brown Jackson? Uh, just two other people I want to mention. Okay. Uh, Deb Halland. First Native American to serve in a cabinet. Yes. Uh, President Biden. As Secretary of Labor, which is long overdue. You should have had an indigenous Secretary of Labor a long time ago, uh, of the interior a long time ago. And then you got uh, Rachel Levine, who is the first openly transgender person oh. to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate, um, Assistant Secretary of Health. Yes. Yes, so, two other good ones to highlight. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I mean, we don't have much time left. No. But I want to highlight Katanji Brown Jackson because she, while she is, is just nominated, if she gets uh, approved and becomes our next Supreme Court justice, she will be the first black woman on our Supreme Court. Which yeah, and I huge. I think she'll get in. I hope so. You, you've you've had a number of uh, Republicans saying that she's qualified. She is absolutely qualified. Um, so they have kind of backed themselves into a corner. If she's not qualified, why aren't you voting for? Her? Right, right. Um, so I'm just going to kind of read off of her. Uh, Wikipedia um, will read her early life and education. She was born uh, in 1970 in Washington, D.C., September 14th. Her parents were both graduates of historically black colleges and universities. Um, her father, uh, Johnny Brown, was a lawyer who ultimately became the chief attorney for the Miami-Dade County School Board. Her mother, Ellery, served as school principal at New World School of the Arts. Well, she so she comes from a very, very educated background. Uh, while she was in college, Jackson's uncle, Thomas Brown Jr., was sentenced to life in prison for nonviolent cocaine conviction. Years later, she persuaded a law firm to take his case pro bono. And President Barack Obama eventually commuted his sentence. Another uncle, Calvin Ross, served as the Miami's police chief. Uh, she grew up in Miami, Florida. Uh, and graduated from Miami Palmetto Senior High School in 88. Uh, in her senior year, she won the National Oratory title to the National Catholic Forensic League Championships in New Orleans, the second largest high school debate tournament in the U.S. Wow. Holy crap. Uh, she studied government at Harvard University. She performed improv comedy and took classes in drama and led protest against a student who displayed a Confederate flag from his dorm window. Holy crap. Uh, she graduated in 92 with an AB magnum cum laude, having written a senior yep. thesis entitled The Hand of Oppression, Plea Bargaining Processes, and the Coercion of Criminal Defendants. 
Uh, she worked as a staff reporter and researcher for Time magazine from 92 to 93, then attended Harvard Law School, which is hard as heck to get into, where she was, especially if you are a marginalized person, um, she, where she was a supervising editor of the Harvard Law Review, and she graduated in 96 with a juror's doctorate. Cum laude. Yep. Um, her career, she served as a law clerk to Judge Patty B. Saris of the U.S. District Court of the District of Massachusetts from 96 to 97, then to Judge Bruce M. Celia of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit from 97 to 98. She spent a year in private practice in the D.C. law firm Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin, now part of Baker Botts, then clerked for Justice Stephen Breyer from, of the U.S. Supreme Court from 1999 to 2000. Uh, she worked in private legal practice from 2000 to 2003, uh, first at the Boston-based law firm Goodwin Proctor from 2000 to 2002, then at the Feinberg Group, now Feinberg and Rosen LLP from 2002 to 2003. From 03 to 05, she was an assistant special counsel to the U.S. Sentences Commission from 05 to 07, she was an assistant federal public defender in Washington, D.C., where she handled cases before U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. A Washington. Which I got to say, OK, that particular Court of Appeals is considered a stepping stone to the Supreme Court. Oh, OK. Um, the a Washington Post review of cases Jackson handled during her time as a public defender showed that she won uncommon victories against the government that shortened or erased lengthy prison terms, which is very impressive. From 07 to 2010, Jackson was an appellate specialist at Morrison and uh, Forster? For, 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 Forster? Forster. Okay. Um, which is like, that's Jesus. In uh, 2009, Obama nominated her to become vice chair of the U.S. Sentencing Commission. The Senate confirmed her by unanimous consent on 2010. Uh, she succeeded Michael E. Horowitz, who had served from 03 to 09. Uh, she served on the Sentencing Commission until 2014. Um, it, during her time, it retroactively amended the sentencing guidelines to reduce the guideline range for crack cocaine offenses and enacted the drugs minus two amendment, which implemented a two offense level reduction for drug crimes. Wow. So, I mean, I could keep going. I could keep going. There's so much on this lady. She has. So like she has the qualifications and she is so smart and she's. um Very. Uh, She's she's really humble, <laughs> but um, she's firm from what I've been able to see. Like, I really hope she gets it. I really hope she gets it. I think she will be a very good addition to our Supreme Court. Yeah, and she clerked for uh, Justice Breyer, who's the uh, justice who's retiring. And oh, OK. Okay. Generally, a clerk has the same legal philosophy as the person they clerked for. So she's re... Uh, okay, so she's basically replacing her old boss. She's yeah. being nominated. She was nominated for her old boss's position. That's kind of cool. Um, and with that, I think we're going to end the podcast. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this. There's... Uh, I will have... All of this posted up tomorrow so y'all can read all of these articles. There's so much more information than what we've presented in an hour. Um, we hope you, you know, enjoy uh, learning about some pretty badass women. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for listening to Learning to Law. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, and share in all your favorite places. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Learning the Law, Ron at Necrokijo, that's N E C R O K I J O, and me at Phoenix Nymphy. If you have any questions, please tweet, comment, or email us at Two Lazy Dogs Media at gmail.com. This has been a Two Lazy Dogs production.
Bye, everyone.